live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, this is Fox 12 Now. I've been showing some of our live cameras here for every segment. That one is up there on Ski Bowl. That is up Mount Hood. It looks amazing up there, and I'm sure some people are enjoying that weather, uh, as you should if you are up there uh, heading to the mountain. Congratulations. Hello, I'm Greg Dubley. This is Fox 12 Now. So we live stream here every weekday, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific and going throughout the afternoon, uh, bringing you coverage of all kinds of different content and segments and different topics that we get to go into here on this show. And we are live streaming on our website, our apps, Facebook, and YouTube. So lots of places to find us. Just always like to remind everybody uh, that they can do so and share those afterward. Right now, though, we're talking about a breakthrough from the University of Oregon in partnership with L'Oreal. And I'm talking about the cosmetics company. And the, part, part, the breakthrough has to do with what's right there on your screen, artificial skin. So what is artificial skin? What can it be used for? How is it being utilized? And what, what kind of uh, interesting things do they have with this breakthrough? Well, to join us to talk all about that, we have Paul Dalton, associate professor from University of Oregon and lead here on this, on this project. And especially, I, I'm really excited to get into the 3D printing side of things you know, when, when we get to that in, in this interview. But to start off, Paul, you know, thank you for joining us. And um, tell us you know, just about what this, what this project was. Yeah, great. Well, first off, thank you very much for having me here. Um, we're really excited to, to finally talk about this project, which we've been working on for about five years now. And so this artificial skin is actually living skin. So we get cells from people and we can populate a scaffolding structure and we can recreate the, the many different layers that are in skin to a level which um, has not been achieved before. When we talk about artificial skin, just in general, I mean, I guess this is real skin, uh, but creating it like that, what was the process like before and what were those big differences that you have now? Yeah, so um, there's been a, like a decades long um, approach to try and make skin in a dish. And this helps things like um, minimizing animal testing, understanding some of the, the medical challenges that are, are faced um, with skin diseases and injuries. Um, but really what, made this project a bit different was how small we can 3D print structures. And so um, here at the University of Oregon, we have like nanoscale 3D printers. So we're printing fibers at the like one one hundredth the size of a human hair. And by going down to these very, very small levels, we can build up structures, these scaffolding structures that then can be populated with cells and they then turn into living skin in only about 18 days. And so yeah, here you see an example of a, of a, a scaffold that we make. And so um, if you consider like a regular 3D printer, the smallest you can make um, things from there is, is probably two diameters of the human hair. And we're printing down like one tenth, one hundredth the diameter of a human hair. And this makes all the difference. Wow, I mean, that is so precise and so small. And what is this material that's, that's printed out to make that scaffolding? Yeah, so we focus on stitches and suture materials. So we're not trying to invent the materials. So if you've ever done anything adventurous in your life, um, you've probably had to have some stitches put into you. And the dissolvable stitches, the ones that normally just um, absorb by the body, that's what we use here. And we try and use all the different processes that um, that we know we can make this not just in vitro, but also to the clinic later on. So when you, you print this out, you print out this scaffolding uh, that you've created there, and then you're able to take the cells, the skin cells, and apply them onto that. And because of that process, so uh, I guess just to, for, for a layperson's understanding, so comparatively before, you would have to build that up. But now with that scaffolding, that, does that allow it to grow the skin, I guess, in more of a natural way? Yeah, and so within the skin, there are these different compartments and there's like barriers in between them. And so what we were able to do with our nanoscale printer was create uh, like a really important barrier that still allows the communication of cells. And this, like I said, the, it's not actually us that's doing all the work. It's the, it's the cells that you put in there. And uh, cells, they, they know the environment that they live in in the body. And so when you put in a, a similar environment, even though it's made of you know, degradable sutures, um, you also get the same kind of skin that gets formed. Wow, that's incredible. So um, I've got a lot of questions. Uh, one though, just for, let's talk about the 3D printing side. I mean, this is, 
what what did it take for you to be able to print to that small of a diameter compared to all these other 3D printers, even at their smallest, being you know wider than a human hair? Yeah, so um, you know, this is something that I've been working on probably for about 15 years now. And so, you know, trying to push those limits to make smaller and smaller fibers. And um, we apply a voltage to that, and um, there's this kind of weird physics that happens that actually allows you to be printing um, very, very small fibers. And so uh, that is a key part of how you get printers down to these small size. And, you know, even what we do in the lab, we, we get a regular hobby 3D printer and we hack it, we, we convert it and we turn it into this high resolution 3D printer. And so this is one of the things that I'm also really excited about is that, you know, new technologies don't have to cost more. And so it's a lot of the printers that we're, we're building here at the University of Oregon, um, they are like a thousand dollars. Whereas if you were to get this from a commercial source, you, it would be like over a hundred thousand dollar price point. And so we're really trying to to change the dynamics and accessibility of 3D printing, and this uh, approach of making very small fibers is central to that um, that task. I love it that you hacked basically a regular 3D printer that somebody can go get and figure that out. I mean, you mentioned affordability and accessibility. That's that's huge right there um, to, be, to be able to do that. And so, um, you know, continuing on the 3D printing side of things, I mean, and being able to print this small and using it as this example, I would imagine there's myriad other examples of different ways that you could use this and apply this type of technology. Is that right? Yeah, and you know, there's there's so many um, medical diseases and injuries that we still need to solve. And you know, this is an extra tool in the toolkit. So when you think about skin, um, okay, we're creating this the skin in a dish, and this can help um, like cosmetic testing and reducing animal experiments. But there's some serious burn injuries which we can't treat still. And so you know, this could be used for skin grafts. Um, diabetic foot ulcers are another major um, challenge in the clinic, and so we could use this uh, material there. But then beyond skin, there's also utility of making artificial tendons, um, corneas as well, and also blood vessels, heart valves are being used with this technique as well. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting time, and I'm really happy to kind of have like a very unique um, laboratory down here at, at, uh, in Eugene. I mean, that's that's incredible, just what you mentioned right there. So do you think this kind of technology is something that eventually could be extrapolated into even saying, like printing an organ or something that advanced? Well, you know, I think that define an organ, right? Because, you know, skin, I suppose, is an organ. But if you're thinking about kidneys, if you're thinking about livers and that, there's, there's a really a long way to go just because they're so so thick and so the, 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 they have a large volume and it's difficult to get all of the things into play. So you now we're looking at some of the thinner structures of the, of the body like tendons and like skin and uh, really kind of focusing on that as, as the, the more um, you know, realistic kind of tissues and, and organs that we can be um, trying to fabricate. Um, for this study, you, know, you, you mentioned you've been working on this for five years, but really it sounds like even longer working on the technology behind that. Uh, but for this, for this study with L'Oreal, you know, the applications, you mentioned that it could be used for um, testing cosmetics, but also some skin grafts. Can you go into that a little bit more and just explain what this could be used medically to help people out? Yeah, so like on, on a very like fundamental level, we can understand like how does like adult skin form and regenerate and repair? And um, you know, from that, there's if someone has a has a burn and you want to replace that that section of, of tissue, then you could do that. And you know, uh, you can tell my I'm not American, I'm, I'm Australian. And uh, in my hometown, we have a, a very famous um, skin doctor, Fiona Wood. Uh, she's um, you know a remarkable surgeon. And so you know, I'm very inspired by by leaders in the field that really demonstrate this medical need. That, that we have to address. And um, this is just kind of one way of doing it. So, you know, for example, um, if there is a, if there's a, a severe burn, you could take some of the patient's own cells, put the scaffold down, and then be able to spray the cells back on top. There is already spray on skin, but it has some limitations to the, the end results. And so, you know, we really see the scaffolding structure, especially since it's based on degradable sutures being something that 
um, can fit in with the clinical perspective that um, surgeons have. Wow. So yeah, just to be able to put it there on, you know, wherever the, the burn or the damaged skin is, put that on, put the skin over it, and then it'll just grow right in. And that's dissolvable. So eventually that structure will dissolve, I would imagine. Yeah, and it sounds like magic, but you know, yeah. it's science. You know, as we kind of work through all the different complexities of being able to bioengineer different tissues, um, you know, this, this it gets complex, but um, you know, this is the field that we're working in. And so uh, we do rely on the body and its healing properties um, but uh, there are still some missing pieces so that we can really address some of the um, medical challenges that we face today. When it comes to L'Oreal and, and using it in that way, what is it being used for right now as, as far as the skin that you're able to create? Yeah, so, so really it's just about showing that in, and in about 18 days we can form like a really nicely structured skin as you would normally see um, in the body. And so... You know, this is the first level. Um, we're already looking at scale as well because it's it's okay to make something once or twice or ten times, but you really have to make it 100, 500, thousand times and do this reproducibly. So we're, that's our kind of next focus as well is being able to make things at scale and and really be able to meet the the demands of of, of um, you know of, of a large of a large company like L'Oreal, but not just L'Oreal. There's many different um, people around the world that could really benefit from having such scaffolding structures. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, amazing. Well, as far as the research now, you know, that's out there, people can go certainly take a look and, and learn more about it. But what do you think is the most important thing that people should take away from the study right now? Um, I think the most important thing is that by trying to um, make structures in our body, like similar to us, um, cells do respond to that well. So um, that's that's really important. I'm trying to make things um, from a resolution perspective, like how how fine structures can you make, but also um, just using degradable stitches that we've probably all had in our body at some point in our life um, to not try and change things too dramatically on that aspect. That really does help the, the translation of an idea into practice. Amazing. Well, uh, I want to say thank you very much you know, for joining us here to talk about this. Congratulations on the success of this. I guess my final question is, what's what's next? So you mentioned scaling up and doing it a lot of, you know, hundreds of thousands of times or thousands of times versus 10 times. Um, but what does it take for you to get to that next level? Yeah, well, actually, you know, we, we, we make great progress on that. You know, we, we do have a, a manufacturing focus lab here, but we, we we take that that scale up into perspective. I think one of the things that I'm, I'm most passionate about now is like, how do we get this accessible to people and accessible to the researchers? And so this, this program where we have, where we get these hobby 3D printers, these toys, and convert them into like high performance machines that biomedical engineers can like, they can build it themselves and they can do it at a fraction of the cost to try and like empower people because there's, there's a lot of um, limitations in, in biomedical research between those who have money and those who don't. And I'm just very much opposed to that. I really want people to help themselves and to have access to like really high performance systems that just cost a, a fraction of the, the cost of anything commercial and probably print better. So um, that's that's kind of the one of the main focuses at the moment in my lab. I mean, I can only imagine how exponentially that'll increase just the medical research in general of getting getting that that type of ability, you know, uh, to to people to have have them have access to that. That's sure, that's and it's, it's a grassroots it's a grassroots approach, right? You know, the you, you could say have a company and you can sell all these printers, but if you can like have this set up as an instruction kit where people can go out and help themselves. Um, this allows people in a much broader context be able to access the technology, innovate it. And you know, if you want to be playing around and pulling apart an instrument, it's much easier to do that with a thousand dollar system than like a fifty thousand dollar where there's a warranty and all of that attached. So it really drives innovation. And I think that as we get into this 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 project and this initiative, um, this will be just become much more accessible to bioengineers not just in the US, but around the world. I mean, yeah, the innovation, just kind of a DIY attitude toward it too, and, and experiment and come up with other things, other processes probably off of what you've created. So very, very exciting stuff. And Paul, I just want to say thank you very much you know, for joining us here today to talk about this. Um, congratulations, like I said, I mean, this is really, 
uh, and a really incredible achievement and just seeing where this is going to go, what this can change for people. And this can be a huge difference maker in a lot of different ways. So thanks. Thanks for being here on Fox 12 now. Thanks a lot, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for everybody who's watching too, again, this is Fox 12 now. So we get to cover a lot of topics here on the show. Um, earlier today, we were talking about Boeing and some of the issues going on there and what you should know about that. But now talking about perhaps the future, I mean, the, the future, artificial skin and, and this uh, scaffolding that uh, they were able to create. So really incredible stuff. So thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, we are here every weekday from usually from one to two. We're live, but sometimes throughout the afternoon as well. And if there's ever breaking news, this is where we'll be. So uh, anytime outside of our other newscasts, you can join me right here. You'll get an alert. We'll bring you whatever the breaking news is as much as we possibly can get to you as quick as possible. So thank you for being a part of the show. I appreciate it. I'll sign off for right now. I'm Greg Dibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.